Hey guys, what's going on? My name is Steve Kinney. I'm a producer, engineer, and content creator here in Nashville, Tennessee. I've been making music and recording music for well over a decade now, and I've made a ton of mistakes along the way. I haven't always done it professionally. Let's just keep it at that. And a lot of those mistakes that I made were incredibly simple to fix. So today I'm gonna to be sharing with you five mistakes that are ruining your productions, ruining your mixes, and how to fix them. Now normally on my channel, I talk a lot about Luna, UAD, and Apollos. However, Noise Hub Media has asked me, along with a number of other content creators, to collaborate on their channel, which is a great thing. So if you appreciate seeing me here, a number of other content creators, please hit the like button, please hit the subscribe button, and leave a comment below. Let me know of a simple mistake you made and how you eventually learned to fix it and overcome that mistake and make your productions better. Your comment might be the key to somebody else's masterpiece, so um, definitely leave Leave that comment below everyone appreciates it and the first mistake that i see a lot of people make is not high passing your signal now you're probably saying right now steve i do high pass my signal and i'm sure you do because you're a smart engineer but do you check that same signal along the way as you start to add more plugins like uad plugins and this occasionally results in some subharmonic content or some sort of low-end rumble and in other cases it could be because of aliasing so if you're adding those plugins along the way you want to be checking your signal for any sort of weirdness in that low end area. Anyways, you get the picture. Don't just high pass at the beginning. You want to be double checking your signal along the way. When digital audio is really just ones and zeros, computationally speaking, those ones and zeros add up a lot, even when you don't hear them. So look out for them. They're probably hurting your mix and it's super easy to fix. If you see any weirdness down at like the 10, 20, 30 Hertz region, just high pass it super easy. All right, mistake number two, incredibly easy to make and incredibly easy to fix. It's not paying attention to your background noise in your recordings, not cleaning up your tracks. I think a prime example of this mistake can be found during vocal tracking. You know, a lot of times you'll be in a booth, sometimes the headphone cable will smack the mic stand. You might hear a fan noise or AC noise in the background, but you'll definitely be hearing breathing. You might have some coughing in there. Now, obviously you'd probably edit out coughing. I'd hope you would, <laughs> but you can also find this stuff in acoustic guitars or other live mic'd instruments if you're not careful about mic placement. And of course, if there's any musical rests, why would you not clean up the spots where the acoustic guitar is not playing? Now it's tedious to do. You gotta just delete and crossfade your way into the source material. And again, with vocal tracking, that's a lot of cutting, that's a lot of fades, but cleaning up your track like that is really particularly worth it. And it's how you're gonna take your tracks from entry level to professional very quickly that alone can really increase your quality of your mixing and your productions. So take the time, it's worth it. All right, mistake number three, having your signal level either too low or too high. Both ends of the spectrum kind of have their own inherent problems. A lot of times people will ask me how to get loud masters. They'll say like, hey, I'm, I'm cranking this thing. They're just slamming it into the limiter, but it's still coming out kind of weak. And they're like, man, I just don't know why it doesn't sound as big. And basically what they're doing is they're just throwing off their entire balance of the mix. And in many cases, they also probably forgot to high pass. And as a result, all of that computation down in the 20 Hertz region where you can't even really hear it, it's just eating up all the headroom and the balance of their mix is just completely thrown off. Like the guitars will be way loud relative to the drums. You know, the vocal will be kind of buried in there somewhere. On the flip side, if your source signal is too low and you have a waveform that there's sound there, but like you look at the waveform and it's pretty much just a line, like a flat line across the GUI and your, you know, your timeline view, that creates a totally different problem. You know, I've had people come to me like, I don't know why my mix just can't sound big. And I pull up their signal chain. They've got like five compressors on, they've got EQ, and none of the compressors are even reacting. If your signal level is too low, you're kind of spreading your amplitude across fewer bits of information. So in a roundabout way, you are kind of hurting yourself by tracking your source material too low. So there is still in digital audio, a happy medium. Now 32 bit float might change that, but that's a whole nother 
topic in and of itself. On the point of really quiet signals or low signals, I think that's a function of having your headphone volume way too loud or your monitor volume way too loud because if you have it cranked, you'll only be gaining up your preamp just a little bit and you'll go, oh yeah, that sounds good. So my best advice there is make sure that you're kind of setting your overall monitor volume and your headphone volume at a level that's comfortable. Pull up your favorite song on Spotify and gain up the volume on your headphones until it's comfortable and it's reasonably loud. And then do the same thing on your speakers and then just never really change that level. Then you'll always have a point of reference that you can come back to. Problem number four has made its way into every single nook and cranny of modern productions, and that is relying on autotune as a crutch. And when I say autotune, I mean Melodyne, any sort of pitch correction. Now, when I was a kid and I made music in my bedroom, recorded music in my bedroom, I would do vocal takes for hours. I was a kid, I didn't sound good. <laughs> well, at some point I got a hold of a copy of autotune and I thought, awesome, I'm gonna be able to take my vocal, make it sound that much better. My mind was kind of in the right place, but what eventually happened is I grew to have a crutch. I grew to realize what could be tuned and sound natural, what I could just get away with. And then that was my acceptable standard for a vocal take. And I became a worse singer for it. So you really wanna get that award-winning vocal, but do you really? If you do, take the time, record the vocal so it sounds phenomenal before you do any processing to it. Then when you go to do your processing, you're really just gonna sync it into place just ever so slightly. You're gonna implement that little bit of tone that the pitch correction software gives as well. And that's gonna make the listener on the other end go, wow, this vocal is amazing. All right, number five, simply uttering the words, fix it in the mix. No, you can't, it's not gonna happen. If it's bad going into the box, it's gonna be bad coming out of the speakers. No matter how many plugins you throw on it, no matter how much stuff you do to this signal, it's not gonna sound good. So do whatever you have to do to get it right going in. That might be swapping out a microphone, that could be swapping out a guitar, that could be changing the position of the mic. Whatever it is, get it to where it is the sound on the way in. That way in post, rather than trying to have to take a bad sound and morph it into something that's not bad. As a matter of fact, if you do utter the words fix it in the mix, that should probably be a sign to just start over. But anyways, get your signal there before you even go into the box and then you'll wow yourself afterwards once you finish it in post. All right, number six, bonus round. I think not auditioning things is a huge mistake to make. Now, I only threw this one in the bonus round because I recognize that sometimes you just don't have a choice. Maybe you only have one microphone. Maybe you only have one guitar. Maybe you only have one thing or one instrument. And that's okay if you're in that situation, that's totally fine. But if you do have multiple instruments, if you do have multiple microphones, there should be no excuses. You should absolutely be auditioning. If you're tracking a vocal, for example, right? Whenever you go to do BGVs, reach for a different mic. You're gonna impart a different sonic character on that vocal. It's gonna be cooler. It's gonna work better. If you're going to track a lead vocal and you have a couple different condensers or a couple different mics that you like to use on a vocal, pop them all up into the booth and have your singer sing on all of them. Do like a verse and a chorus or the end of a verse and the beginning of a chorus and just kind of see what the tones sound like and start to do a process of elimination. If you have a couple acoustic guitars, and you only have one acoustic guitar part, try them all. There's no reason you shouldn't. The point is, when you audition your source material, you get the very best of the best going in, just like we talked about in the previous step. So if you made it this far into the video and you found it useful in the slightest, please hit the thumbs up button and consider subscribing to the channel. And again, leave a comment below of a mistake that you might've made at some point in your career and how you fixed it, how you overcame it. I'm sure it's gonna help someone out. So anyways, thanks so much for watching guys. Cheers.